when it comes to native fruit trees in eastern North America. There is one that stands above all the others when it comes to its valley to pollinators, providing food for birds and critters, the numbers of caterpillars it hosts, and for the economic value of its wood. And that tree is the wild black cherry, Prunus serotina, which also happens to be the native cherry with the largest range in eastern North America, and it can be found just about everywhere except the tip of Florida and once you get way up north into Canada. This tree is probably best known for the high quality furniture that is made from its wood, but its ecological value is incredible and worth diving deep into, which we will. Wild black cherry also has some interesting and toxic phytochemicals, like many of our native fruits, that I will delve into later in the video, along with a bonus tree. Who doesn't love bonus content? That bonus is a rare tree that is considered endangered across its small native range and was once considered a subspecies of the wild black cherry, but has now been separated from it. We have a way to go before we get to it though. So let's start with where to find wild black cherry growing and how to identify it in the field. Wild black cherry is a pioneer species and can be found growing in areas that have undergone some type of natural disturbance, such as a fire or a storm opening the forest canopy, or human caused disturbance, such as a logging operation or in fallow agricultural fields. This is our largest native cherry species and is a quick grower, which averages from 60 to 80 feet tall with a 30 to 60 foot spread when mature, with a canopy that has variable growth form depending on how much competition it has. It tends to be tall with a narrow crown if competing with other trees and has a more spreading and open crown when grown without competition. Its size makes it large enough to be harvested for lumber and wild black cherry has some of the most sought after wood for creating fine natural wood furniture. Wild black cherry trees with especially straight and limb free trunks are often sold for veneer quality logs. Natural wood veneer is a thin sheet of wood that is sliced from the log in one continuous long strip. Think of sharpening a pencil only on a log size scale. These thin sheets of wild black cherry veneer are used to face plywood, giving it the look of the expensive hardwood at a much lower cost. These veneer grade wild black cherry are among the most monetarily valuable of our native hardwoods. Even though wild black cherry can get quite large, if you wanna grow one and don't have the space for a huge tree, it can be coppiced or cut to the ground every two to three years to maintain it as a large black cherry shrub. Like many pioneer tree species, wild black cherry thrives in full sun and can only handle a small amount of shade. If wild black cherry is fully shaded, it will be stunted at best and most likely it will not survive. It is adapted to a wide range of soil types, including rocky soils, if they are well drained and moist to occasionally dry. It does not tolerate overly wet soil. Once established, wild black cherry is moderately drought tolerant. The leaves of wild black cherry resemble those of many cherry and plum species. They are elliptical to oval in shape and average three to six inches long by one inch to one and a half inches wide. The upper side of the leaf is a glossy dark green that contrasts with the very pale green of the lower surface. The upper surface is smooth and the lower surface has yellow brown to rust colored fuzz along the central leaf vein. Leaf margins or the edges are finely toothed and the teeth curve inwards. There is a pair of small extra floral nectaries near the base of the leaves on the petiole or what is often called the leaf stem. These nectaries produce nectar without flowers and attract several species of holictid and andrenid native bees as well as ants, which are the main target as they may help rid the tree of some of the many insects which come to feed on its leaves. The leaves are arranged alternately on the twigs. Crushed wild black cherry leaves have a bitter almond smell and taste which I'm gonna explain more in a bit. Fall color ranges from yellow to orange. The leaves of wild black cherry are fed upon by at least 340 species of caterpillar, ranking it second only to oaks when it comes to total Lepidoptera that use it as a host plant. A couple of the better known species that host on wild black cherry are the snake mimic caterpillars of the beautiful Eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly and the chonky green caterpillars of the awesome Promethea moth. In addition, a ton of other insects also feed on wild black cherry foliage. All of the caterpillars and insects draw a ton of songbirds which feed on them. White-tailed deer will browse on wild black cherry, although they seem to prefer growth on younger seedlings and stump sprouts. One thing to be aware of with wild black cherry is it can be toxic to livestock. That bitter almond smell and taste gave a good hint as to why. The foliage, along with other parts of the wild black cherry, contains cyanogenic glycosides. I'm gonna cover these glycosides in depth in a bit, but I wanted to mention them while we're discussing things eating the leaves. 
Under normal conditions, wild black cherry foliage tastes bitter and most livestock won't eat enough of it to hurt them. But if the leaves wilt, like on trees or limbs dropped by a storm, a reaction occurs within the foliage as it wilts, converting the glycosides to cyanide and also making the leaves very palatable to livestock. I think you can see the problem here. If wilted wild black cherry leaves are eaten by livestock, it takes far less for a lethal dose and death occurs quite rapidly. Just something to be aware of if you own any type of ruminant livestock or horses, which are quite sensitive to the toxin. I am always referring to caterpillars and host plants in these videos, and if you are looking for an easy to use guide to which caterpillars eat which plants, I highly recommend David Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America. This is a book in the Princeton Field Guide series, and it is super easy to use. You can look up host plants by common or scientific name. Same with caterpillars, moths, and butterflies. It is easily one of the top five used books in my library, and I know you will love it too. I will put a link to it in the description. This is an affiliate link, which simply means we get a commission if you purchase the book. No extra cost to you. We simply get a small commission from the seller, which helps support the channel. The bark of wild black cherry is quite distinctive and is shiny, smooth to slightly fissured, dark brown to black with grayish silver highlights and conspicuous light colored horizontal lenticels, those wart like growths on tree bark. As the tree ages, the bark becomes rougher and will peel in curled flakes that give the tree an interesting look. Like the leaves, the inner bark of wild black cherry also has a bitter almond smell and taste. The inner bark has long been used to make an herbal remedy, cough suppressant and sore throat relief syrup, which is still available from many sources commercially today. That flaking bark also helps some critters that need all the help they can get these days, bats. Many species of bats roost in trees during the summer, and several of them love to snuggle up under exfoliating bark like that of a mature wild black cherry. One species known to roost in wild black cherry is the northern long-eared bat, which is super cool and has some nice pointy elf ears, or vulcan ears if you're more into sci-fi than fantasy. Which brings up a good question. Which do you prefer, fantasy or sci-fi? Let us know in the comments. Personally, I like both, and right now I'm reading the Wheel of Time series and watching Stargate Atlantis. Another bat known to roost in wild black cherry is the hoary bat, which is named for the frosty look of its fur and happens to be my favorite eastern bat species. The twigs of wild black cherry are reddish brown with a satin look to them. Breaking a wild black cherry twig will allow you to smell that distinctive bitter almond scent. New growth at the end of the twigs is a bright, shiny green. Love learning how to identify our native fruit trees like the wild black cherry? Then please help out the channel and go identify that like button. Wild black cherry blooms in April and May, depending on location, after the leaves have emerged, but the flowers are quite showy and still easy to see. The individual flowers are white, small, around half an inch across, and have five petals like most flowers of plants in the rose family do. Yep, wild black cherry is in the rose family, the rosaceae. The flowers form in long pendulous clusters called racemes that are mainly along the tips of the branches. The racemes sway easily in the breeze, making them stand out even more. The flowers draw a wide assortment of native bees, including helictid bees, andrenid bees, bumblebees, and of course, the introduced honeybee, along with many species of flower flies. A wild black cherry in full bloom is usually buzzing with pollinators. The flowers give way to small round cherries in midsummer, which start out green, turn to bright red, and ripen to a dark purple black, the reason why the tree is named black cherry. Sometime in late summer or early fall, usually from August to October, depending on location. These cherries are small, around 3 8 of an inch in diameter, and form in the same longer seams the flowers were in. They don't look like cultivated sweet or tart cherries, either in size or the way they grow on the plant. They look a lot like pokeberries, and I always get comments about them not being cherries whenever I post a picture of them online. The cherries are edible with a caution. There isn't much pulp on them. They are mostly seed, and that seed is loaded with cyanogenic glycosides. So don't eat the pits. They have a sweet taste, but with a rather harsh, bitter aftertaste, and are best used in jellies, jams, and wines. Fun fact! 
The black cherry that is a popular flavor in many foods and drinks is not from wild black cherries, but is made from varieties of cultivated sweet and tart cherries. Birds love the bite-sized wild black cherries, and they are sought after by a huge variety of songbirds, game birds like the wild turkey, and even other wildlife like squirrels, white-tailed deer, and even black bears. The large pits tend to go through the songbirds and they get deposited elsewhere by them. This is something to be aware of as wild black cherry spreads mainly by seed and it makes a bunch of them that the birds are quite happy to distribute. Wild black cherry can become weedy in some situations, but it is such a powerhouse for pollinators and wildlife, I think it is worth it even if you must weed out some seedlings every now and then. I have mentioned several times that wild black cherry contains cyanogenic glycosides, which are compounds that release cyanide under certain situations. Wild black cherry contains the cyanogenic glycosides amygdalin and prunicin, and these are the compounds that give it the distinctive bitter almond taste and smell. All parts of the tree contain the compounds, with the highest concentrations being found in the seeds, leaves, and inner bark. Under normal conditions, there is no free cyanide within the parts of wild black cherry, but if the tree is damaged or the leaves begin to wilt, there is an enzymatic reaction that occurs that releases cyanide. This is why the wilted leaves are so dangerous to livestock. The other process that can cause these glycosides to release cyanide is enzymatic action during digestion, which is why it is not a good idea to swallow wild black cherry pits or chew on the leaves too much. Native wildlife and caterpillars seem to be well adapted to these compounds and feed on wild black cherry fruit, leaves, and twigs with little trouble. Now it's time for our bonus tree. There is a rare cousin to the wild black cherry, the Alabama black cherry, Prunus alabamaensis, that is mainly found in Alabama, a bit of the Florida panhandle, and a couple of spots in Georgia and South Carolina. It is considered rare to endangered over its entire small range. It is a much smaller tree that only grows to around 35 feet tall and can be found growing in sandy soils along with longleaf pine and in pine oak scrub woodlands. It differs from the wild black cherry not only in size, but it has leaves that are distinctly rounded with short abrupt tips and a hairy petiole or leaf stem. At one time, the Alabama black cherry was considered a subspecies of the wild black cherry, but it has now been separated and is considered a distinct species. Definitely a tree to keep your eye out for if you live in the deep southeast. Wild black cherry is an absolute powerhouse for pollinators and wildlife, and even if you don't have space to let one grow into a towering tree, it can be maintained as a shrub with some periodic coppicing. There is another native fruit-bearing shrub that also makes a great choice for an area that isn't suitable for a tree, which also happens to be known for containing cyanogenic glycosides. That shrub is the common elderberry, and you can learn all about it in this video and be sure to take some time and enjoy nature in your backyard.